Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Consulate General of uh, Australia in Mumbai, the Asia Society, and the Observer Research Foundation Mumbai, I extend all of you a very warm welcome. Before we begin, I'd like to uh, present a memento to our uh, speaker today, Mr. Rowan Kallick. And uh, to Consul General, uh, His Excellency Mr. Mark Pierce. Thank you, Sunshine. Friends, a month ago, uh, our chairman, Mr. Sudhindra Kulkarni, uh, led a delegation of uh, members from the Gateway House and the Observer Research Foundation, Mumbai, uh, to China. Um, we were there for a week, and we had hectic uh, parlays with uh, the Chinese think tanks. And um, what, uh, what we could glean from our week-long visit was that, as uh, on the one hand, China is getting ready uh, for the new normal, um, uh, probably a lower uh, growth rate, a, an altered demographics, a, a different kind of uh, a mix of uh, economic activity. Uh, but what we did not uh, see signs of was of uh, China being a fragile superpower, as some have talked of it. And uh, I think today's talk might give us some insights uh, into how this uh, country is shaping up in the future uh, in spite of the constraints uh, that it is facing and uh, how uh, uh, you know such bold initiatives are emanating out of this country in the form of uh, the One Belt, One Road and the Asian Infrastructure and Investment Bank initiatives about which um, many of the scholars we spoke to uh, wanted to know our opinions of and uh, so we would uh, really in this topic uh, the Xi Jinping ascendancy we would uh, look for answers to these questions of what really makes this great nation tick now over to His Excellency Mr. Mark Pierce for the opening remarks Thank you very much and thank you for your kind gift as well. I'd like to thank the Observer Research Foundation and the Asia Society. We at the Consulate General have a lot of friends in, in both think tanks. Uh, we rely on you. We always gain from coming here and listening and learning. It's therefore a privilege to have an expert Australian um, who can talk about a subject in which I'm sure you're all interested in. Now, I'm in the embarrassing position where I have met Rowan Kallick only today, but I've been reading what he writes for more decades than I think either he or I would find it convenient to remember. That's hard, I'm only 21. <laughs> <laughs> I, I wasn't born on February the 29th. Um, but uh, I first started reading Rowan Kallick's work when he was living in and writing about Papua New Guinea, our closest neighbour, and in my personal opinion, the most beautiful country in all of the world. Um, it was fascinating, deep, intensely felt, considered writing of a kind. There was no counterpart to it uh, in Australia or anywhere else in the world. We can't hear you, Mr. Pierce. Okay, no, no counterpart in Australia or anywhere else in the world. Thanks. Now, now Rowan's going to talk to us about China. Now, Australia is different from India. If you talk about China in Australia, you suck the oxygen out of any room. 
Uh, you start an evening talking about China, you never end up talking about anything else. It's slightly different here. But we have the pleasure tonight of hearing a talk by somebody who really knows the place. Has had a long term in Hong Kong as China correspondent and a long term in Beijing as China correspondent. Um, a book which again I've encountered only today and not yet been lucky enough to read but look forward very much to that Rowan tells me is number three on the bestseller list in the Chinese edition in Hong Kong and Taiwan. Now, a warm-up speech, I think, should always be shorter than you dare to hope. So I intend to finish now, not just so that Rowan can talk, but so that all of you can have the opportunity to ask him questions about China afterwards. Thank you. My name is Pinky Tucker, and on behalf of Asia Society India Center, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this evening's discussion, the Xi Jinping Ascendancy with Rowan Kallick, Asia Pacific Editor for The Australian. The conversation this evening will explore China's growing dominance in the global order and delve into the intricacies of modern day Chinese political structures. As many of you know, Asia Society works in the areas of policy and business, arts and culture, and presents creative, cross-disciplinary perspectives, fresh insights, and informed ideas with diverse speakers. Through dialogue with leaders, thinkers, and citizens, we explore vital issues facing Asia on the global stage to create awareness and effect change. As an independent, nonpartisan organization, we share multiple points of view with stakeholders who can put new and fresh ideas into practice. I would like to acknowledge that the financial support provided by our corporate, individual, and patron members keeps us operational in India. Asia Society in India raises all of its money locally, and I'm happy to share that with your support, we've presented over 500 programs in the past eight years as part of our mission to forge common ground to inspire and improve the world. As you may know, Asia Society is on Facebook. By liking us on Facebook, you will receive the most up-to-date information on future programs at Asia Society, as well as current affairs and the latest happenings in Asia. If you're tweeting about today's event, don't forget to tag us at Asia Society IC to build on the conversation. And now, allow me to introduce our speaker for this evening. Rowan Kallick is the Asia Pacific editor for The Australian and author of Party Time, Who Runs China and How. Previously, he was the Hong Kong-based China correspondent for The Australian Financial Review, and a senior writer with Time Magazine. He received the Graham Perkin Award for Journalist of the Year in 1995 and has won two Walkley Awards for Asia Pacific coverage. He's also written Comrades and Capitalists, Hong Kong since the handover. I'd now like to invite Mr. Kallick to deliver his remarks, followed by audience Q&A. Thank you. Thank you so much for such a warm welcome and uh, Thank you to the Observer, to the Australian Consulate, and to Asia Society for hosting this, this event. I'm very uh, scared to see such a big crowd, and I, I hope I can provide you with something to think about or to argue, to argue with. Um, when leaders visit uh, countries when they're first elected, there's a sort of game that people play as looking at which country do they visit first. In 1978, I visited India. I came to Bombay and I went to Calcutta. I didn't get to China until 1981, so uh, may, maybe that, uh, that might indicate a sort of precedence, but it's wonderful to be here in India, particularly at this moment. And on the eve of uh, the conclusion of a uh, free trade agreement between Australia and India, which, will, uh, which is already exciting a lot of interest down under, and uh, I think with almost a million uh, people of Indian background now living in Australia, it doesn't sound like much to you, but uh, of course our country only has about 22, 23 million people. So 
so uh, you know, it's a, it's a reasonable crowd. So uh, uh, the relationship seems to be a very happy one, and it's very important for us to uh, to build it, make it closer. I'm going to speak about one person mainly, but uh, through that one person, we inevitably encounter. Um, a body, an organization which is unique in the world. Political analysts and historians veer from one side to another in determining whether individuals matter more than movements or economic and social conditions in explaining events and trends. In my own book, which Mark mentioned, Party Time, I relate how China had been ruled by committee men, and I mean men because no woman has been a member of the Politburo Standing Committee uh, in the history of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, so China had been ruled by committee men for at least 25 years. Um, then came Xi Jinping. No one could say he came from left field, that he is an outsider, or that he wishes to usurp the 66 years of Communist Party rule, indeed the opposite. The party's unique claim to pervasive power over every single aspect of life and thought within China's sovereign borders, and indeed beyond, wherever people of Chinese ethnicity live, even though it may choose for its own convenience to withhold that power in places or at times. Uh, that unique claim closes it off from the possibility of reform from without. So after a long period of somewhat sclerotic rule, it needs a period of classic Leninist purging from within. Like a computer, that becomes frozen, maybe because too many programs are running simultaneously. Well, I don't know much about computers, I must admit, but what I do, maybe some of you do, is you turn it off and reboot. And she is the reboot man. His so-called anti-corruption campaign uh, is really a purge, a reboot, which is, which, uh, embraces both of the issues that most arouse Chinese uh, popular passions and potentially antipathies to the party. Pollution and corruption. Fitting into Xi's narrative as the byproducts of ill discipline and disobedience to direction from Party Central. This purge or campaign will not be halted while he's leader, which means at least until 2022. Uh, and some analysts, such as uh, Willie Lam uh, from Hong Kong, believe he will find ways to remain in power well after 2022. Uh, I'm not convinced that that will happen, but uh, there are some possibilities. It's a complex debate. Who is Xi Jinping? He grew up within uh, the party's womb as the princeling son of Xi Jongshun, one of the communist eight immortals who also included Bo Yibo, the father of the ambitious Bo Shilai, who was last year jailed for corruption. Xi reached the top because former US Treasury Secretary Henry Paulson says, and he got to know him years earlier when he was uh, a provincial party boss. He says, he's the kind of guy who knows how to get things over the goal line. She had no intention of merely acting as a consensus sounding board like his lackluster predecessor, Hu Jintao. It soon became clear he wanted the power in his own hands and was prepared to take big risks to secure it. He has succeeded at almost every turn, becoming today the strongest Chinese leader since Mao Zedong. 
some of us started saying since Deng Xiaoping, but I think it's clear now that since Mao Zedong is a safer, is a safer comparison. A status that was underlined not too long ago by the arrest of Zhou Yongkang, a figure who uh, was until the last, uh, the last change, was a member of the Politburo Standing Committee himself, and a figure who, as the security head of China, struck fear into many, and who now stands accused of accumulating vast ill-gotten gains. Xi Jinping doesn't want this authority just for himself. He's devoutly jealous for the party he loves. The party that incorporates China, its history, its culture, and its emblems. Just as he incorporates the party. So the party incorporates everything about China, and he incorporates the party. His crucial anti-corruption and anti-pollution campaigns that I mentioned are explicitly in pursuit of a strengthened and purified party. No longer the vanguard of an international proletariat, this party is being recast as the true inheritor of an ancient Chinese tradition of infallibility and rectitude. And this well befits the first core of elites who have ascended to China's top ruling positions based on hereditary rights since the fall of the Qing dynasty. So it's not only Xi but others from the Pritzling group who've emerged on top of the party. And they would say, we're people you can trust. We're family. And uh, a, a, a phrase has been used about Hu Jintao, Wen Jiabao, and, uh, and others from other factions, in their case the Tuang Pai, the, the Chinese Youth uh, League. The phrase is used about them that they're just hired hands because they're not part of their families haven't gone back deep into the, into the roots of the party. She has established new whole of government commissions on international and domestic security, on economic reform, on cyber security and, and the internet, and others, all of which report to him personally. So bypassing the, uh, the government structures. He is irritated and disappointed by many of the institutions of government, which he is downgrading, disrupting, and where possible, dissolving, so that he can have a clear line of sight to his fellow party leaders in the centre, as well as those in the provinces and in the townships. And in return, they metaphorically see him watching them, clear that away the detritus of, uh, of government layers and uh, uh, red tape and things which he believes are standing in the way of the party re-emerging as the party of the people with in direct control. <clears throat> He's been portrayed as both nationalistic and as pragmatic in pursuing Chinese territorial claims in the South and China's, East China Seas. He's certainly, of course, the former, he's nationalistic. The leader of almost every, any nation, by definition, is nationalistic, in my view. Um, it comes with being the leader. But he's not using this issue primarily, <clears throat> as some clever analysts claim, to keep the People's Liberation Army happy, <coughs> excuse me, or to repair party legitimacy. He believes it's right. And in Chinese terms, those sovereignty issues are not, of course, foreign affairs issues, they're domestic issues. And so the, um, the, the nine-dash line that is used, um, that was in fact inherited from the Republic of China, a map from 1947, it's a strange story, but anyway, that was inherited. That, that um, uh, in terms of how the party sees it, that proves that those uh, 
uh, areas, those rocks and islets in the South China Sea, are part of China. So he's not grabbing something from someone else. This is, these are sovereignty issues. Um, it's about, this is all about the Chinese world as delineated at its peak, the late Qing. So everyone in this room probably knows we can see maps. We can have maps all going around the wall, uh, the wall of uh, China. That itself is a challenge. What does that name mean? The word Zhongguo for <coughs> that's used by China itself today to describe itself is a comparatively new term. Other terms were, were used uh, previously. It's only a 20th century term, in fact. So we could have maps and we can see China actually looks different. But um, uh, the party is quite firm and clear. What China really means is the China of the uh, late Qing. And that's what, uh, that's what counts. Except there's one actually, this is just a byword, a, by a very intriguing exception, Mongolia. <coughs> me. If you see these maps, you see, and so if you go to Taiwan, you speak to Republic of China fans, Gomindang fans, they will have maps which show Mongolia being part of China, but you won't see it in China. <laughs> she acts primarily out of the conviction that comes from his upbringing as a princeling born in a devoted and famous party family. Even though his father was purged in a terrible way, actually, during the Cultural Revolution, and he himself ended up being sent to the countryside. Um, she would, set, would see that it was the rotten gang of four who got it wrong, not the party itself. He is sincere. He is a true believer. And he's become immensely popular for his anti-corruption campaign, which is extending much further than anyone had expected in terms of uh, the people targeted, both in rank and in numbers, as well as in duration. <coughs> His favorite phrase is the Chinese dream. Broadened during the APEC summit in uh, Beijing last November into an Asia Pacific dream. And since then we've heard it's the Asian dream. So, um, I don't know how many people in this room are, are dreaming dreams, but uh, whether your dream is the same as Xi Jinping's dream is an intriguing question. Um, that dream involves now, we've seen a little more, some more clues. He's dreamt his way into this great narrative, the, the new Silk Road, the maritime Silk Road. Uh, the belt, uh, lots of things are all incorporated. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. All of these are a part of the same idea that um, as we move into the 21st century, all roads will lead to Beijing. In, uh, in the ancient European and uh, near uh, Middle Eastern world, all roads led to Rome. In the 21st century, all roads will lead to Beijing. This will be to the benefit of everyone in the periphery, as China would see it, because they can benefit from uh, China's uh, economic power, its benevolence, and to be uh, part of that dream, uh, part of that development story, is a great thing for China to impart to its neighbors. That's the invitation held out to India held out to Australia. When Xi Jinping came and spoke to our parliament, he talked about, you are uh, part of my idea of the, of the maritime Silk Road. So, um, so we're part of this. And he, he's used this very intriguing phrase, uh, common destiny. And the, we haven't heard a phrase like that before, uh, since, the uh, Asian co-prosperity sphere, which emerged in Tokyo in the uh, 1920s, or maybe before that, I, I'm not a great Ch Japan expert, but certainly, of course, we saw it in the 20s and 30s. <coughs> so the idea that this is part of a common destiny amongst all people in Asia, and we in Australia now see ourselves as Asians. We just hosted the Asian Soccer Cup 
and uh, no arguments. It was a debate. When I first migrated to Australia, I'm originally English, you might be able to hear from my accent, but then it's very controversial, is Australia Asian, but now we are Asian too. So this is our common destiny as well as yours. Um, Deng Xiaoping opened China's manufacturing sector to foreign investment, technology and management, which came overwhelmingly from Taiwan and Hong Kong. And this proved a fabulous success. She wants to start doing the same with China's services and consumer sectors. He's committed to globalization as a crucial component of China's economic rejuvenation. Pursuing it alongside nationalism isn't aberrant, and most successful modern Asian leaders share both values, including Shinzo Abe and, uh, uh, dare I say, Narendra Modi as well. I think that uh, often foreign leaders fail to understand who or what they are dealing with when they're meeting uh, someone like Xi Jinping. The disappointing Barack Obama especially. There are exceptions and I'll come back to them. Our own Prime Minister Tony Abbott made a classic misreading during Xi's visit, state visit following the G20 summit six months ago when Modi also came. He, uh, Abbott said at the state dinner in Canberra, he thanked uh, President Xi for his, what he called his historic, historic statement, I, I was there in the room at the time, made in Parliament about China becoming fully democratic by 2050. I was quite shocked to hear Tony saying this. <laughs> but the statement actually pledged to turn China into a modern socialist country that is prosperous, democratic, culturally advanced and harmonious by the middle of the century. A routine enough list of adjectives, actually, in the Chinese political context. By Xi's standards, of course, China is already democratic. Its party representing fully the will and best interests of the people. Last, um, uh, last year, the party's uh, fourth plenum or leaders meeting addressed the related idea of the rule of law. And this meeting was framed by <coughs> a widely circulated quotation from Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping's venerated father. China would be always at risk of disaster if the leadership did not discern where the supreme power of the country should lie, the party or the constitution. And this plenum determined that party leadership and socialist rule of law are identical. So uh, the, the prospect of rule of law, meaning what it means to you or to us, is not quite the same. It's not quite the same at all. Um, it really means rule by law. Um, In the run-up to the uh, uh, National People's Congress uh, meeting this year, the annual parliamentary session, attention was drawn to Xi's newest slogan, the four comprehensives. These are comprehensively to build a moderately prosperous society, deepen reform, govern the country according to the law, and apply strictness in governing the party. The party flagship, People's Daily, uh, said these four are complementary. Quotes, shining more brilliantly in their shared company, combining Marxism with Chinese practice. And the fourth, which was added to this list later, of course, refers to the purge underway that's dragged more than 200,000 officials in for questioning. 
it's been said that this campaign has acted as a sweeper, removing the obstacles to reform, and that strengthened authority has led to the revival of stagnated reforms, although these do not involve any significant loss of state economic control. <coughs> The picture that uh, is being painted, and I'll return to this now, the picture that's being painted by Xi Jinping about the region obviously interests people in India particularly strongly, and I can imagine this. You have a substantial physical border with China. And it's a picture that makes Barack Obama's Asia pivot idea appear somewhat desultory. Its realisation is already appearing to be um, inexorable if you sit in China with the whole neighbourhood caught up. Only Japan <coughs> and to a degree India have the capacity to consider standing to one side as these swirling silk roads start to be realised. The China model, viewed as the top international template by the World Bank, has begun replacing former foreign aid-driven concepts of development. And it's sending out its state-owned corporations, which control the key strategic heights of the Chinese economy, as well as private firms supported by substantial fun funding. Uh, and as China's foreign exchange holdings are brought home from their long-term passive investment in U.S. Treasury bonds and are made available for regional investment. Chinese leaders love to read history and they're now starting to channel their understanding of Britain and the Netherlands' fruitful initial deployments into Asia via economic entities, their East India companies. China doesn't want formal colonies into which these profitable European forays eventually involved, but it does want to build the infrastructure that must, much of the rest of the region lacks. This would accelerate Asian growth overall and it would link the new modern communication systems, freeways, high speed and freight rail lines, air routes, ports, even internet providers into China as the vast hub. This is all part of a new great game that is far eclipsing its predecessors. The involvement of China's neighbourhoods in production chains is a process that has been underway since China first began its opening and reform under Deng Xiaoping 35 years ago and became the world's factory. But the process is about to receive an enormous acceleration, one that will enable Beijing to feel it can start to retire the mantra of the party about suffering a century of foreign humiliation beginning with the Opium Wars. The hour of foreign vindication is at hand instead. Uh, the decade has involved this testing uh, by China of its neighbours' attitudes to sovereignty with those forays in the East and South China Seas, and it hasn't resolved from that exercise. But it's learned something from the readiness of the region to resist and to seek greater involvement by the US, <coughs> and is now deploying resources into its new economically driven Silk Road vision as well. While not ceasing to build structures, particularly in the South China Sea. So on the international stage, Xi Jinping is being thus especially innovative and daring. 
only one factor I think is capable of providing uh, strong restraint to such extraordinary ambition. The simultaneous ascendancy, so I g gave the title of this talk the Xi Jinping ascendancy, but we see the simultaneous ascendancy of two other leaders of immense power, ambition and capability in Asia at the same time. Uh, making up a remarkable troika such as we haven't seen in, I believe, at least two generations. Of course, those people are Shinzo Abe and Narendra Modi. Um, how they found ways to perhaps cooperate to achieve mutual aims. They each have the power in their own uh, countries to um, uh, bring people with them to uh, for to find ways to cooperate productively, or whether, like elephants in a small space, they're doomed to fight, we'll find out in the future. So far, so good, in my view. They're looking to find ways to cooperate. Um, but ascendancy, yes, so much is clear, while other, other things swirling around Xi Jinping still remain a little mysterious. If you see uh, pictures of him, he, uh, he has a, compared with his predecessors, I think a fairly open face, a bulk. And uh, on New Year's Eve in China, they opened the uh, office doors. I don't know, they created an office on a, on a TV set. I don't, no one really knows, but he was pictured uh, at his desk speaking to the nation. He had pictures of his father uh, next to him. Uh, TV viewers could see that. He was pushing his father in a wheelchair. Charming picture of him and his wife, his famous wife, famous singer, Peng Li Yuan. And uh, um, this, this helped cement this idea uh, of Xi uh, as the new father of the nation. Not everyone is, is on board the Xi bandwagon. Uh, this has been a period of unprecedented uh, control of freedom of thought, uh, clamped down on uh, the internet, and of uh, imprisonment of journalists and academics such as we haven't seen since the period immediately after 1989. And uh, that is a part of, uh, of what comes from uh, a person such as she exercising such comparatively untrammeled power in such a proud and uh, uh, powerful and persuasive state. Thank you. Good evening. And thank you for uh, enlightening uh, lecture. Uh, since your book is based on the interviews, what is the general per perception of uh, people about uh, Chinese this politics and the influence of the party? Pretty well everyone uh, um, uh, alive in China today um, well, the great majority of people alive in China today have been brought, have been born and brought up in the People's Republic. So this is their frame of reference. They, um, they only know the party running China. Um, they don't actually see easily how exceptional and unusual, uh, and some people might even say aberrant, is its polity form of governance. Sometimes when people uh, leave China, they see, they see other worlds and they start to look in a different way at their own. Not many do. Uh, so most people in China have been 
I would say, pleased to ride the road of prosperity, which has happened in the last few years. No, the 30 years of Mao uh, saw an end to civil war, but Mao had prosecuted the civil war himself. And, and uh, so it's rather strange for him to receive congratulations for um, ending a war which he had, he had fought. But anyway, uh, we had 30 years of really China drifting under him in terms of prosperity, but then since then there's been this massive, massive rise and China having its own model to an extent, but mainly following what's happened, the successful route of industrialization and in international exports <coughs> of, of, their, of China's neighbors. So for most people in China, I think that's true. But I, I, my book contains many different views because this is a country of large population. And uh, um, I'm uh, constantly amazed and humbled by how people also have a capacity for independent assessment. And some, uh, even some loyal party members have started to feel um, we have a capacity to uh, have more say in how we choose our own leaders. And that uh, uh, for the nation to be kept in a sort of form of infantilism is, uh, is demeaning. Those people uh, are in, can, you, we could talk about it at, in a, over a lunch table or in the family home or with some friends. But once you start to, um, talk in any way to a larger group, but certainly to organize. The party has an immense capacity to, uh, to find out who's doing what and to prevent this. So it's, been, it's put a lot of resources into um, using the internet as a tool, not so much of um, education as of surveillance. Very effective. And uh, it, it's worked to an extent. How long will that keep working for? I'm not sure. I have this, so I have this view that the next generation uh, won't feel quite the same because they will have grown up, certainly the middle class, um, and China after 1989, the party did a lot to make sure the middle class were on side because the students were, were off side, they were demonstrating. Uh, then they put, they put a lot of money into universities, into academics, and to make sure that the middle class was loyal and they were rewarded. They were given the, the government apartments they were living in and so on. So uh, that worked quite well. But I th my view is the next generation, they, they grow up in a world where they have a car, they have a maid in the house, uh, they travel internationally, they may be educated uh, tertiary overseas or whatever. And they don't see uh, or feel that it's thanks to the party and its sacrifice that this has happened. So rather casually they feel, well, if, if pollution continues, if issues happen, you know, I, I feel unhappy, I, I feel I deserve the right to have my say. The party is finding some ways to allow people let, to let off steam. It started with some idea of township elections, didn't quite really work and is a pilot, some they haven't really taken off, but they, they're now going to another model of uh, meetings in uh, town hall type meetings and people vote, they have different cards. And uh, in China, of course, they have red and blue and the red card is yes, <laughs> not stop. Red card is of course yes and the blue card is no. So in, in, uh, in a part of, Huang, uh, of Hangzhou, uh, the mayor goes and speaks to people. And does it. Will this be enough to, um, to head off eventual feelings that the party has had its day, we should have a new type of governance? I don't think so. I think ultimately China will change, but I, I don't want to make any bets about when that's going to happen. But we can see Taiwan next door. A very successful democracy in many ways and uh, culturally pretty Chinese.
someone I'm sorry, the I'm right. I'm sorry, there's so many, yeah, I don't course, want to cause you to um, I've been influenced by Martin Jacques' book about on China, where he says that at some stage China will rule the world. Do you believe in that? Yeah, uh, no, I don't. Martin Jacques was the editor of uh, Marxism Today in London, and he's got a determinist view of history. And uh, my own view differs, and I think. Uh, that uh, we can even see in uh, East Asia, look at Vietnam, uh, ruled by actually a similar enough system. Uh, but Vietnam is clearly not best of friends with China at the moment. And uh, uh, it's not going to tolerate China continuing to as they see it, I don't want to say who's right or wrong about these islands, but as Vietnam sees it, tolerate these sorts of incursions. Uh, look at Japan uh, under Shinzo Abe, having something of a revival of its self-confidence. If that is combined with economic revival, then Japan will really get some steam, I think. If the economy doesn't revive, it, it won't amount to so much, but uh, my view is also China doesn't really want to rule the world in that sort of a way. This is not, China's not entering into an ideolo ideological uh, conflict with the West. Uh, the party is the incorporation of China essentially, this is what it's, what it's about. The party can't incorporate um, Korea as well, let alone uh, China. So uh, I think uh, that uh, the China's rise owed a lot to its international engagement, its gl to globalization. It's benefited immensely from investment and uh, having managers and expertise come from overseas into China and now from its own investments overseas. So uh, I feel China wants to, does want to be the centre of its neighbourhood. It has no friends in the periphery. 14 countries around it, unless you call Kim Jong-un in uh, North Korea a friend, but who would want a friend like that, you know? Recently he uh, killed his defence minister with a, I don't know if people saw this, uh, pretty horrific, uh, with an uh, anti-aircraft gun. I mean, not very nice. Uh, so with friends like that. Yeah, and dragged out his uncle from the meeting and had him shot. So, uh, China doesn't have friends in the region. It would, it does want to be uh, determining how the region works. It believes genuinely, and Xi Jinping believes genuinely, I think, it will benefit everyone to have China's uh, benevolence uh, playing a role. But the world, not. It, it does, but except there's, a, it, there's some people in China who believe in G2. Um, but not everyone even believes in uh, G2. So I think there's still, that's still a work in progress. But whatever they believe, I don't think it can happen. Is that the lady down the back? I found your, uh, some of your comments very interesting. Uh, I'm Pia Matani and I'm an economist and author. Uh, one of my books is titled India, China and Globalization. Uh, I'd like to ask you a question about this uh, recent anticipation about an expansion of economic cooperation between India and China. Do you anticipate, do you envision that that could play an integral role uh, in uh, uh, Asia of, over say the next three to five years or do you rule it out? this expansion in economic cooperation between India and China, given India's history and uh, recent uh, interaction with China over the last two, three decades uh, and the unresolved territorial issues. Do you anticipate say, expansion would uh, uh, take place uh, or do you rule it out? And if you, if you anticipate that there would be an expansion in economic cooperation, do you think that that would play an integral role in Asia's politics? I would 
uh, I, first of all, my answer, I have to say something unpopular here. Um, that my view is until Narendra Modi was elected, probably India did not feature right in the center of Xi Jinping's thinking. China tends, has tended historically, you know, not to think about India too much. The mountains are in the way or something, I don't know why. And uh, there's a cultural awkwardness. I mean, uh, you know, China has uh, Confucius, of course, Mao Zedong hated Confucius and sent red guards to smash up Confucius' tomb, though now the party loves Confucius. It's trying to find values. Uh, and one of the ways they're looking for values is through Buddhism, which did not have its origins in China, I think. And so, uh, so there's a complicated uh, history. Will China and India find closer economic relationship? Surely, must do. Uh, at the moment, uh, e uh, trade between China and India is about two-thirds of the trade between Australia and China. This, is, this cannot persist, although we do have this very large amount of certain commodities that China has a hunger for, but still, uh, how much more ca will the relationship with, uh, between China and India deepen? Modi is the sort of figure to capture the Chinese imagination. They like dealing with countries which have got uh, leaders with personality and determination and are predictable. They like a bit of predictability, stability. So particularly, you know, if he's re-elected and so on, I can see this uh, really being the basis for... Now, just how this will shape up, I'm not sure. As I said, China's got lots of liquidity. They're looking to uh, uh, somewhere to plant it where they'll get more return from them from US treasuries. I think it's, uh, India has a, uh, uh, has a, a shortfall of infrastructure. This would seem to be a very good match, I, I think. And uh, India is looking to be with the uh, Make in India program. Need, India needs to be part of, more part, of, more, more a, an essential part of the value chain that runs through Asia. So uh, those other places in East Asia, they're all in it, you know, Korea, Malaysia, Singapore, they all have got some services side, or in Hong Kong they go to meetings and, uh, and sign agreements or whatever. India must find its place in that, surely, as, uh, as India starts to take off again. And I wouldn't like to predict exactly how or why, but uh, Obviously, of course, there's a lot happening. When I was living in China, I would see Indian entrepreneurs there, but it needs to step up both ways, and investment is an important way of that happening, I think. Let's do two more questions. The yeah, in fact, before we take, I'm sorry, before we take this, uh, in the, the penultimate question, I think I'll reserve my right to ask the last question. Okay. Uh, I just want to make a small announcement. That tomorrow at uh, around the same time in the evening, we are having a talk on India, China, and globalization, and the uh, rise of the emerging superpowers, economic superpowers, and the impact and the, on the global economy. And so that is on the book written perfect. by Ms. Pia Mehtani, uh, who just asked you this last question. That's perfect. Oh, Everyone so must go to your speech. So all are invited. So <laughs> <laughs> it's just tomorrow, and it's not by design, but this just happened that the next day. We are having a discussion again on China. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's very Australian. Okay. <laughs> I, uh, I have a two-part question. First part is, uh, I found it interesting when you compared Modi, Abe, and Xi Jinping. Yeah. And now what I know, uh, at least about Modi and Abe, is that they both came on this big wave of like, we're going to reform, we're going to be strong nationalist leaders who change the fundamental way the economy is run. And both haven't done much. I mean, and that's being charitable. I don't think Modi's done much. Maybe some people here do. Okay, fine. But um, how much reform has Xi Jinping actually done in the Chinese economy? And the second part of the question is that right now, the India-China relationship is basically 
we sell them raw materials like iron ore, and they send us the finished goods. And uh, it's basically like a, you know, like a one-way trade. Basically, China gets most of the benefit, and India is kind of like losing out on that. So, to what extent do you think that's going to change? So, uh, not reformers or re reformers. Uh, well, I I think it's fair to say Shinzo Abe has certainly changed things in Japan. We've seen uh, the uh, he's got these three arrows of uh, reform and uh, uh, you know monetary policy has certainly had an effect, and uh, we're seeing growth start to take off again, inflation is happening. First quarter 2.5, not so bad for Japan. And uh, cultural change is happening as well. I, you know, a lot of effort is going into bringing more women into the workforce and uh, uh, there's a whole stream of things that are happening. Since I've been here, people have told me that quite a lot of things that your Prime Minister has uh, set in train. Now, you know, some people have got impatient in one year, but maybe those things that are set in train will see results over time. I, I, I'm not well equipped to judge that. I'm just uh, here to listen on that. But I think um, in Xi Jinping's case, uh, he, he can do things more easily. He can give out instructions and um, he has started to uh, he has started to do that the main thing that I the main project is this new normal restructuring the economy making it more modern by uh, making it uh, more of a services economy bringing more skills making the services economy more productive so far he's held back from a key part of this which is Invo involving uh, foreign investment in that services side and in consumption. Uh, and I think that uh, he's going to have to do this. That's how manufacturing, as I said earlier, manufacturing really, how China became the world's factory, partly th through having the best of the world's manufacturers coming to China. He will need the world's best services sectors coming to uh, China also, you know, uh, I, I was this afternoon speaking to some people at uh, Tata Consulting, you know, why can't they have a role in, in that, uh, in that uh, restructuring, uh, trying to become more efficient uh, in the services side? Um, I, think it's, I think it's a work in progress, but I think it's going to happen, we're just at the start. So I urge some patience here. Uh, the second thing I'd say is, uh, yes, it seems like the advantage, it may seem to some people as if you're selling commodities to China, them sending you manufacturers, maybe to their advantage, but not entirely. You know, In Australia, we've got a similar situation. And what we've had is inflation, under control because we're buying much cheaper goods from China. We've had the benefit of, the, of those cheap goods being within the price range of ordinary people in Australia. So we've benefited from those, uh, being able to buy those products. And so I say, people's lives have improved. But you have one million or two million people and we have 1.2 million. 23 million, yes. Yeah, yeah. In fact, there are two, two small questions. Uh, one is on the one road, one well. In fact, while you just touched about the topic, uh, you mentioned about, uh, you made a very interesting statement that sovereignty issues, uh, according to the Chinese sentiment, are not really international issues, but they are no. domestic. Yeah. And so in that light, how does the one, the, the Maritime Silk Road, uh, like, you know, how does that sentiment fit in there? Because we, in our interactions with some of the Chinese think tanks, it appeared that it's almost a given that everyone will fall in line and say, say yes. And so how can they not? And the second question is, 
uh, that you again said that uh, all roads in the 21st century will lead to Beijing. And uh, again, that like you know, all the neighboring countries and even the ones that are far off along the road and the belt will gain from China's benevolence. That, that's their thinking. I'm not that's saying right. I agree, but exactly. that's, that's the thought. So, and yeah. you also said about uh, the common destiny and how yeah. Australia is now part of China. So is it just you are uh, mentioning <laughs> the, the sentiment of President Xi? Yeah, or I'm not, is yes. That, are you subscribing to that view? No, I'm not, I'm not subscribing to this view. <laughs> But I am saying that this is my understanding of what the thought is. And um, uh, I think it, uh, I can read you a very interesting quote here. Um, when, uh, and this is, so it's not entirely new. When Hu Jintao, the previous president and general secretary, came to Australia, he delivered a speech to our parliament in 2003. And he started his speech by saying this. Though located in different hemispheres and separated by high seas, the people of China and Australia enjoy a friendly exchange that dates back centuries. Back in the 1420s, the expeditionary fleets of China's Ming dynasty reached Australian shores. <coughs> For centuries, the Chinese sailed across vast seas and settled down in what they called southern land. In today's Australia, they brought Chinese culture to this land and lived harmoniously with the local people, contributing their proud share to Australia's economy, society, and its thriving pluralistic culture. This astonished people, and they sort of forgot about it, because he went on to talk about more mundane things. What on earth is that about? I know what it's about. Sorry, who said it? Hu Jintao, the president of China, said this in the Australian parliament. And, uh, so this was actually about the idea that Admiral Zheng He, this uh, famous uh, uh, admiral, at, at, uh, a British submarine captain, had written a, has written a series of crazy books in which he claims Zheng He sailed to almost everywhere in the world and uh, adduces all sorts of dubious evidence. You know, he, I don't know if he went to the moon or Mars, but anyway, <laughs> and so it's very funny. And so this is a sort of, uh, I'm afraid, strange to us uh, thinking, but uh, in China, not. It's, it's quite serious. And so, you know, you can have debates, for example, about Tibet, you know, and people will say, I know I've been to the uh, Institute of Tibetology in Beijing, and people say, you know, Tibet has always been firmly controlled by, uh, by China as a part of the Chinese nation, you know. But actually, this, isn't, this cannot be borne out by history and so on. Uh, so this is, this is all part of, so you raise a good question, but, uh, but I, I don't really have an answer. And I think when I talked about the exceptionalism of China, I think it can, can hardly be understated how unusual uh, China's form of governance and this idea that everything is controlled and inside the party and that Crucial to that is China's control of history and the party's control of history. They go to extraordinary lengths to make sure that uh, historians with alternate views, even on subjects like um, uh, 19th century <coughs> subjects like the, uh, the who are the, 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 uh, the rebels in 1900, the Boxer Rebellion. Boxer Rebellion, you know, the Boxers, because they were seen as forerunners, to the party, uh, they were seen as valiant fighters and not crazy cultists. And uh, a professor I know at uh, Zhongshan University wrote a book in which he described them as a bit crazy. And he was banned. The magazine he was published he was published in was banned, and so on. And uh, he ha now has to publish in in Hong Kong. So uh, the control of history means the control of the young minds, and that, that continues. So when you discuss these things with Chinese counterparts, sometimes it's, it's, it's quite difficult. So uh, this is part of a challenge which you face and uh, we face. Uh, China is a serious country. 
It's done seriously well, it's big, and uh, it, its purposes are not entirely evil. It's not an evil empire, but we have to get on with it, and that it's important that we understand uh, what sort of a power it is and what sort of a person is running it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in fact, I know a lot of questions still remain, but we have completely run out of time. Why? Uh, 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 yes, it was. Yes, it was. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I think I will ask. Uh, yes. So, and I would just want to. I want to express my gratitude to the Asian Society, the Council of the Excellency, Mr. Mark Pierce, and of course our special thanks to Rowan Kelly for having this absolutely brilliant and enlightening talk uh, on something that we know how China is. I think we got a better understanding of it now. Thank you so much.